The content of this presentation is proprietary and confidential information of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative. It is not intended to be distributed by any party without the written consent of the collaborative. Attendees should note that the educational component of this session is being recorded and will be published on the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative's website and YouTube page. To maintain complete confidentiality, an announcement will be made before the recording begins and only the presenter will be identified during the recording. Therefore, to ensure privacy, all attendees are asked to mute their microphones at this time until an announcement is made that the recording is complete. Presentations are intended for educational purposes only and do not replace the independent, excuse me, do not replace independent professional judgment. The ideas expressed in this presentation are the professional opinion of the presenter and do not necessarily represent those of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative or its constituents. Before acting on any of the information presented, attendees should consider the appropriateness of the information as it pertains to their individual situation and seek independent professional advice should any concerns arise. If you or anyone you know are in what is believed or perceived to be a situation that is or may become harmful, please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or through their website, suicidepreventionhotline.org or dial 911 in the event of an emergency. That said, on behalf of the collaborative, myself, Michelle, and Mark, my co-chair, Sarah, we're so grateful that you're here this evening. Um, your resume is very long and would take quite some time to go through, um, but you are wow. definitely <laughs> an advocate and um, um, someone who really strives to create the most healthy environment for firefighters, not only through your career, Career, but your amazing willingness and givingness towards everyone in the first responder field. Thank you for making us um, making time for us this evening. Uh, we can't wait to talk about sleep with you. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Good evening, Sira. Well, hello and um, evening. So I know no one else is as tired as I am tonight, but I'm excited to be talking about sleep, partly because I think this is the next big thing that we all need to be talking about. I think, um, you know, the background for the research I've done has been everything from like cardiovascular risk factors and a lot of behavioral health stuff. And um, the more I read about sleep, the more I collaborate with people on sleep, the more I'm like, this is the thing that, this is the thing that underlies all of it and overlays all of it. So I just have a, um, some, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on some of the, these pieces. I'm going to kind of cover broadly what we know about sleep. Um, but really, I think we can't, um, I, I don't think there's anything that we could do. I, I, honestly, I think one of the most significant things we could do is impact sleep in the fire service. But that being said, like you can't have a, a fire service where grandma doesn't call at 2 a.m. for, you know, because she fell or she needs help opening her pill bottle or whatever. Like there's never going to be a fire service. There's been a lot of debate when you look at research in the fire service. Um, sleep in particular about like, oh, we should just do away with 24 hour shifts. Like that's never going to happen because we can't be ever be a service that is like, I'm sorry, we only work, respond to calls from 9 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. And after that, leave a message, we'll get back with you tomorrow. And there's not really like there are departments that do like, um, you know, 10 and 14s or 12 and 14s. Um, it's just not going to be, a, even if you do that, and I've talked to like a lot of people in departments that do that. And I, I get the idea behind it, but someone has to be up in the middle of the night. At the end of the day, that is what impacts your circadian rhythm and circadian rhythms overrule and underrule and run every other system in your body. So like, it's just going to be a challenge. So I did, I do have a question. If you could improve the physical mental health of your firefighters, improve cognitive functioning, decrease risk of injury with one change, think about what that would be. And every time I've asked this in a room full of people, they'll answer things like, oh, do a change to like a 2448, change to a um, 4896. I mean, it's always with shift schedules or something like that. So what we found, and now granted, this is, um, this is preliminary data, for, data from one study, but it was just published. I mean, like, obviously, if there's one thing that you could do, you would do it, right? And across the board, people are like, yes. Until I tell them, um, until I say, okay, so the thing that that is, might be changing the start time of shifts. 
So this study was just published. Um, we worked with Joel Billings on this. He's out of, um, he actually works for Emory Riddle in Florida. He currently still lives in um, Oklahoma. And he did a study that was really cool looking at um, 2448, and I think it was a 2448 and 48 answers. Right, well, I know that now because I just looked at the title again. Now I will give the caveat. With both of these departments um, on these two different shift schedules were very small, not that busy department. So this was for um, for relatively relatively um, low call volume departments. But what he found, so he actually put, we've done a horrible job studying sleep and the impact of sleep in the fire service in the past, and partly because our group and others have looked at if you have a, you know, we'll look at things like excessive daytime sleeping, and so we'll compare 4896 to um, a like a Kelly schedule or a Berkeley schedule. And what we've done in the past, in hindsight, I'm like, God, that was so dumb. But at the time it made sense. We looked at what the shift schedule was of the department. And then we classified based on department, oh, do we see differences in things like excessive daytime sleepiness? Do we see the differences? And in hindsight, I look back, like we um, randomly selected in one of our studies, it was a nutritional epidemiology study, but we collected departments that had a wellness, the wellness fitness initiative and then departments that didn't. And when we went in, we looked at excessive daytime sleepiness. I, without thinking about it, we classified everyone by that shift schedule. Well, especially with that one, we happened to randomly select um, within LA County, the second busiest house in the country. And then in that one, we, it was the worst data collection ever because we went in, we tried to do data collection. Every 10 minutes, they were called out for some sort of call. It was like a revolving door of who was there, who wasn't. Um, and they, and you could see like in the, in the, um, in the entire station, like people, like there was a lot of like, um, grab food and go. There was a lot of, um, it, it, just the entire bite environment was set up for that. Like everyone kind of like camped out in the day room. People would take a quick nap and then be out the door again. We went to another, we randomly selected a, sec a second district in that same department. And it was like, we hung out all day long. We had lots of coffee. We kicked back. They didn't go on one call the entire time. So what we've done in the past, that's funny thing, not a service. Um, to, to answering our actual questions was that we've classified based on the department level. So we've assumed, oh, okay, everyone across this. Not, not the case. And what we did with this study with Joel is he actually put um, monitors, individual monitors on individual firefighters and looked at their sleep schedules. What he found was that, you know, the assumption was that, oh, people would be um, short sleeping on the days that they were working. What he found was not that. He found that actually people were coming to work so the day before they came to, the morning they came to work, they were short slept. And the day they got off, they were short slept. So I think this department had a 7 a.m. shift time or um, shift change time. But what he found was that people with that shift shift um, change time, that people were getting up early to go to work, they were getting up early to come off work. And one of the things, the conclusions, now again, preliminary, we haven't done anything where we've worked with the department to alter this, but was to change the time of the shift start. So I don't know what most departments down there um, change. I know most departments that I've talked to are like this uh, um, 72 or ch change around seven or 8 a.m. Now there's been some speculation that eight is a pretty good change time. It just depends on the department. I think it depends on the call volume across the day. Um, there are departments Austin changes at noon. They love it. I could not stand that, but they love it. Um, a lot of departments are talking about or or shifting to a reverse shift where they change at 7 p.m. at night. So, well, I hate it. I usually follow this up with, if you have the opportunity to change your shift start time, would you do it? And no one in the room raises their hand. Like usually one or two people are like, yeah, maybe we try it. But if you think about the importance of sleep, and I'm going to talk a little bit about like overall, like no kidding, how, how important sleep is. It's just so important that I think we really need to start looking in the fire service at how we can change what we can control. Like you're never, like I said, you're never gonna not have a call at 2 a.m. One of the big questions I get is, um, one of the big questions that I get when I do this is, yeah, what do you think about like a 2448 versus a 4896 or versus what's the best schedule? I don't think that there is necessarily a best schedule for all departments. What I always warn people about is I say, you know, the thing you need to keep in mind is your busiest unit at your busiest fire station. So if you get, you know, people say, oh, you know, we're not really that busy. Um, at most stations, there's only one station that runs more than three or four calls a night. So you need to plan for that station. And a lot of times people will um, talk about that and they'll say, well, you know, 
there's ways that some departments have done it where they say, okay, if you're a really busy house, then you change, you would need to go to a less busy house for your second 24. Once that comes up as an option, a lot of times people say, yeah, no, never mind. We don't actually want that. Um, but I do think you have to, you, because, because sleep is so important and it drives every other system in the body. Um, we did not, one of the questions was whether we tracked whether the departments or, or whether they were allowed to nap during shift. We did not specifically in that study ask that question, but I do think, and I get, um, I get groans when I present to fire chiefs and I get cheers when I present to firefighters. I do think sleeping and napping is important. And I think especially, and you know, there were studies, the, the um, napping studies actually specifically came from um, groups that did um, Oh, pilots. And they looked at, can you do power naps? And the fact is, yes, you can do power naps. The best power naps are not like right before you're absolutely exhausted. It was more like preemptive in the middle of the day. But I do think that napping is important, particularly at departments that are busy. Now I like, I'm going to share screen again, because I think this for me at least gives like the ideal. Okay. So now I, now I understand how important this is type of perspective on this. So Felix Baumgartner is this guy obviously like sponsored by Red Bull and other companies that do crazy stuff. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Felix is in the Guinness Book World uh, Guinness Book of World Records because he dun, 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 went 128,000 feet into the air in a hot air balloon like contraption, wearing a spacesuit atop a ladder. Uh, I don't think the ladder's in this picture. And of course you'd have to go up the ladder, otherwise this would be completely ridiculous. He free fell to earth at 843 miles per hour. So he created a sonic boom with his body. And because of this, the highest, most ridiculous, unsafe thing um, that could be done is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Guess what's not in the Guinness Book of World Records? Going the longest with no sleep because they've determined that it is so detrimental to health. It's so dangerous that nobody should attempt to do that. So we think it's, it really speaks to like free falling to earth at 104, 843 miles per hour. That's safe compared to trying to go without sleep. I think that's, um, for me, that makes me do the, like the, ah, you know, I, I, I get, um, I get how important that is. So when I, when I talk to people about how they sleep, it's interesting. And that people say sleep like a baby, babies don't sleep well. Um, I have a two-year-old and let me tell you that little darling love of my life is up all night long, even at two. Um, but when you think about how much you sleep at night, people talk about, and I've heard an entire range, you know, from people who have really consistent good sleep to people who are like, oh, I only need three or four hours of sleep at night. Um, when you look at the literature on this, they classify it as pretty much eight or more hours, six or six to seven is considered a, a good sleep. Um, and then five to six hours or less than five hours a night. Typically when I ask those questions, it's about 25% in each group. And people will say things, and I said this too, so I'm not like pointing fingers. Um, this is a non-judgment, but people say I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I've thought that, and I've said that. I've said, you know, I've been, I'm so busy, I'll sleep when I'm dead. So there actually is research now that shows if you short sleep, so that less than six or seven hours a night, um, if you short sleep, you are more likely to die early. So it is actually a predictor and can lead to early mortality. So the good news is your death will come sooner. So you'll have that time to sleep. But it is like, the, it, it is that important. And when you talk to people about, do you think that you're sleep deprived? The problem is a lot of people are so sleep deprived and have become used to this low level exhaustion that it's accepted as just as the norm. And they feel like, oh, I'm not really sleep deprived. It's just how I am. Um, and it leads to a new normal of this per, per, um, impaired performance, lower inert, alertness, and reduced energy. And I see this a lot of times when I'm talking to firefighters or I'm in firehouses that they'll say, oh, no, I, I think I'm fine. I think I'm fine. But they're literally falling asleep while you're sitting there drinking a coffee. Now, there are people who talk about um, that, you know, they say that I just don't, I don't need the sleep. Um, and they say it's, you know, I can go three or four hours a night and I'm completely fine. Uh, I would say to that, that is true. That's been studied. It's an empirical question. Um, there are those folks. It's actually been linked to genetic predisposition. And uh, it's been linked to a certain gene that people tend to have that. The way they studied it is they put people in a, um, in a perfect sleep environment. So it was like 
dark, it was cold, it was, and they basically said, I think they had them in there. I want to say one week, but it could have been two. And they said, sleep as much or as little as you want. This is all going to be just based on what you need for sleep. And there were those people, a handful of people who didn't need that much sleep. Now, they were more likely to actually be, um, so it was less than six hours actually in this instance. And it's a subvariant of the, this gene right here. And the chances of having that is one in 12,000. So you're more likely to be struck by lightning than to have this genetic variant that allows you to short sleep. So if you're one of those people, it could be oh, it's no, no. Very, very unlikely that that's accurate. Um, and the reason that sleep is so important is because your body does operate on this 24 hour tempo and it's typically controlled by the light dark cycle. Now there's some work and it's, I think it's really exciting work. It's coming from Dr. Panda out in uh, the Sulk Institute where he actually believes that you can also, and animal studies have good evidence. Um, people studies are still working on and there's debate on it, but it, he basically focuses on the idea that in animal studies, you can actually have circadian feeding. And so that it's not his hypothesis is that your circadian rhythm, which controls this like 24 hour sleep wake cycle that controls everything from eating and drinking preferences to moods and emotion, urine production for body temperature, metabolic rate, hormone release, peak of rhythm in the early afternoon. All these things, he also believes that it's controlled by circadian feeding, feeding and when you eat and, um, the, and if you eat in certain windows. So he did a study, I haven't seen the results yet, but he worked with a believe San Diego Fire Department and looked at can you alter and manage circadian rhythms also by just feeding in certain windows? It's similar to the concept of um, time-restricted feeding or uh, intermittent fasting. So data on it um, is a little bit, I read one article the other day that said it didn't matter, um, but that was that was just one article and I'm not completely convinced that that, that that result was conclusive. So it's an interesting idea, but one of the things that I think is a fun fact is that the um, Olympics and record breaking, you're more likely if your heat or your activity is in the afternoon, the peak of um, performance is in the early afternoon. So more people break records than at that point in time than any other time for the day. So if you're ever in the Olympics, I highly recommend you um, root for that time. Do the firefighter Olympics count by any chance for that now? No. I would say like if you're going to be a bear be a grizzly like that should be your time no matter what that's when you should request so you can break those records um but I don't you know I haven't empirically validated that but that's just my that's my two cents um if you look at the cycle within the night so when you are sleeping the thing that's interesting is you go through non-REM sleep and then REM sleep where basically you take your your, it weeds out and removes the neural connections and carries the packets of information between the brain centers. And so that REM sleep strengthens the connections, um, feeling emotions and memories play out in the brain and the brain appears awake with bodies asleep during REM sleep. So you basically cycle throughout those. An interesting slash scary thing um, that I think that we need to pay attention to is you can't just shift it. So like if you don't go to sleep until, um, you know, you go, oh, tonight I, um, have to stay up till 2 a.m. and then I'm just going to try and sleep in. Like you don't exactly shift those things, you know, where you just catch up on it at a different time. Like your body definitely needs to do move things. And so I think too, one of the things that we should think about when we think about firefighter health, and particularly look at um, looking at uh, like behavioral health of the fire service. I think this, when I say I think this underlies all these different issues, I think that's one of the reasons because you have like even the way you um, share memory or, or store memories and the way things move from like basically short-term memory to long-term memory is, is, I mean, for lack of a better word, kind of screwed up when you're in the fire service. But I think, you know, you can do things to limit it, but I think that's part of the reason we see some of the behavioral health issues that we see in the fire service, because it's really, you know, where sleep is designed to be you know, over a seven to eight hour period and your mind basically takes those memories and sorts out what needs to say and what needs to go away, you don't necessarily um, have that benefit when you're constantly woken up in the middle of the night. So I think that's one of the things that we need to really um, consider when we look at sleep issues in the fire service, when we look at the importance of sleep in the fire service. Um, there have been some studies that have been done in the fire service in particular to look at what um, sleep looks like in the fire service. And there's some good work out of several different groups that have done um, 
that have looked at this topic in the fire service. One in particular is out of Brigham Women's, which is part of, or, or was in, they work in collaboration with um, Harvard. And do, 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 I will show you the results. They did a um, surveys of firefighters, native firefighters around the country, um, and looked at what they saw as their with sh their shift work. And they found overall poor sleep. More than half of firefighters reported poor sleep, which I don't think um, is a huge surprise. Um, but they did find that that firefighter in general shift work, like we know, World Health Organization actually just classified um, shift work as carcinogenic. And that's a significant one, good win, because when we fight cancer cases, it is a known carcinogen now. But when you look at um, the fire service and shift work, we know that there's a significant impact. Most people feel underslept. When we looked at excessive daytime sleepiness, we found that um, it was similar for on and off duty. People reported they were pretty much the same in terms of, of sleepiness when they were on or off duty, but we found that it was increased for folks, who, the excessive daytime sleepiness was increased for folks who slept, who had worked 48 hour shifts or more at a time, linking shifts, busy houses, and private quarters was that were actually sleep promoted, which I don't think the scientists to tell you that. But um, the study from Harvard actually found, and it was 7,000 firefighters, 66 departments, so I think generalizability is pretty good. This was all around the country. They found a third, more than a third of firefighters, screened positive for some sort of sleep disorder. About a third of them were obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. And what's interesting is that typically when you look at like obstructive sleep apnea, you assume that it's, oh, it's only people who, um, you know, have a, a um, high level of obesity or a um, thick neck, those types of things. They actually found that it was, well, that did increase risk, but a lot of people you wouldn't typically assume did have sleep apnea when they were, at, when you were looking specifically at firefighters. 6% um, reported insomnia, 9%. 0.1% shift work disorder and 3% restless leg center. So I think like low hanging fruit in the fire service is we need to get more people screened for sleep disorders and treated for sleep disorders. You know, some pe times people talk to me about them like, yeah, you walk in our, um, our bunk room and everyone has their CPAP. And I'm like, that's like, I feel like that's a success. At least people are paying attention to it. And people I know who started their, um, with the CPAP say, I didn't know how bad I was sleeping. And it's similar to, to other things like the, you know, this new normal, people don't know how bad they're sleeping um, because they just assume that it's normal and it's just not. When you looked at the impact of this, and this is again, this is the Harvard group. You looked at people who had sleep disorders, so that 50, whatever it was, 54% and or 30, whatever percentage it was. You know, you probably memorized it off the last slide. They looked at people who screened positive versus those who hadn't. And they found that those who had screened positive were twice as likely to report a motor vehicle crash. Like, that's huge. They were more than twice as likely to report falling asleep while driving, more than twice as likely to report cardiovascular disease, double the risk of diabetes, and three times as likely to, to report depression and anxiety. So where is that coming from? Is it because they're um, lacking sleep? And is it because they're circadian rhythm? They aren't taking short-term memories to long-term memories? I don't know, but I think that it's not like, I think the numbers, it's statistically significant and that's a pretty big odds ratio. So I think that it's, um, there's, there's something there. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting about, um, that I think is interesting about that whole idea of that they reported falling asleep while driving. So there's research out there that looks at, um, that looks at sleepy driving versus drunk driving. And I'm sure not anyone in our group, in our group right here has ever had that time when they, but I've read about it. And I hear that it's um, like where you do that long blink, where you are trying to driving and you're trying to stay awake and it feels like, oh my God, that was a <laughs> Unless it was, but when you look at what they call drowsy driving, so that like, you know, that long blink, they're actually called micro sleeps. And we do know from the literature that a person drives every hour in a fatigue related accident in the US. And we know that drowsy driving actually is more dangerous than um, drug and alcohol related driving. And I do have to say, this does not mean that I'm saying that people should be drunk driving <laughs> because they definitely, I think both drowsy driving and drunk driving are probably not good, not probably, they're definitely not good ideas. 
But what we found in the literature is you go back and you look and uh, they, when they study a lot of these uh, traffic accidents, micro sleeps, that long blink where you feel like, oh, I just need a second. Your body actually is taking a second to take a nap. So it's about two seconds that your mind becomes blind for a moment of all domain domains. And it really does paralyze your body for that two seconds because your body's trying so desperately to like grab a second to rejuvenate. And what they find when they study these, when they study the, um, the drowsy driving versus drunk driving is that drowsy drivers tend to break later. So even if that two seconds is up and they open their eyes and they're in that alert, non-paralyzed state, they tend to hit things head on. It, whereas drunk drivers, you know, they're, they see it coming and they try to like veer to the left, veer to the right. So they tend to not hit things as head on. But the, those drowsy, drowsy drivers cannot engage in those evasive manu maneuvers as fast. So two seconds at 30 miles per hour, that's a lane change. To, that's a lane change to sometimes into oncoming traffic, which is, um, which is, I mean, it's scary. It's scary. If you look at, um, uh, AAA did a study in Washington, D.C. and looked at the increased risk of car crashes based on the amount of time people slept or didn't sleep. And I think, again, we need to think about this in terms of the fire service. And we're sending, you know, some people are working and up all night, especially, um, especially if they're working uh, on an ambulance, paramedics, and up all night, sleeping less than four hours. I think it's, it, it's something that when we talk about shift changes, when we talk about shift schedules and the importance of paying attention to those things, I think um, it's, it really is something that has to be considered in the grand scheme of things because it's both safety on duty and off duty, right? Um, one of the questions I see in the chat box is how many studies took into account the reason the sleep was lacking or not occurring outside of the shift duration. So that's one of the big challenges, especially when you look at sleep in the fire service and what, when people are sleeping and not sleeping, because you can create even at work like the best sleep environment, you can give them in uh, separate rooms, even if they're not working a busy night shift. We know they're about half firefighters in some departments, even more than that, have second jobs, which is an issue that comes up when we start talking about, okay, if you could do like that one thing that really makes a difference, if that shift change time, would you be willing to do it? And often um, the answer is a lot of really awkward looks because it is a big challenge. And I get, like, I completely understand why that's a big challenge for the fire service. Um, and I get, you know, a lot of people work second jobs. They work sometimes third jobs. I think the volunteer fire service is a whole nother set of questions because if you're on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, when do you, like, nobody could, can't tell. I grew up with a pager or a, 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 a scanner in my house. Like, I thought I slept fine, but I, you know, I can't imagine that dad, that dad did all those years because he woke up to any call that came through. So I think it is challenging. And when you look at, um, when, and I think we have to consider those things, but I also think we have to consider those within the bigger construct of health and wellness and consider it in the bigger construct of what, why do we do what we've done? We're working with Lexington, Kentucky Fire Department, and they actually are considering doing a change to their shift start time. So they started going back and asking a question. They're like, we're going to like tear this down talk about it start to finish, why are people doing what they're doing? And they found out that the reason they had a, I think it's a 7 a.m. right now, the reason they had that was in the 60s, most of the people came to work on the uh, bus and the bus route stopped at the fire station at 7 a.m. So they made that the shift change time because that's when everyone's there. But then the question is like, what, should we be making our decisions did that we now know impact physical and mental health. Um, should we be making decisions based on when the bus drove by? And I get the I get that it's a second job for some people, but also again, if it's increasing risk for cancer, if it's increasing cardiovascular disease, those types of things, um, should we pay closer attention to it? Now I saw a question about caffeine in the chat, and I will say I think caffeine. I when someone asked me to write an article one time on um, on to pull literature on uh, oh energy drinks, so I did and I expected it to be like incredibly um, negative. I expected to come away from it just going like ah that's a horrible idea. Really, if used appropriately, it can actually be beneficial. But I, that is used 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 inappropriately. I think I said that, but I meant to say when used appropriately. Um, and 
I think most, I say that knowing that most firefighters don't use caffeine appropriately, like a um, pot of coffee would not be considered and drinking it across the day would not be considered um, an appropriate use of caffeine. But there are, there are some appropriate uses of caffeine. And when you look at why, um, like what works for caffeine, what doesn't work for caffeine, we do know, and by the way, I do want to sh- um, do a quick shout out to this book because I think if you have any questions about sleep, obviously, if you logged in to this, you have some interest in sleep in general. Um, I think the best book that I've ever read on sleep, in fact, one of my top five books that I've read, probably, I'm going to go out on a limb and say one of my top five books that I've read ever um, in terms of impact on my day-to-day activities would be this one. And it's um, it really, Matthew Walker does this and he talks about how there's this amazing breakthrough that does pretty much is the golden ticket to everything. Um, Improves your health, improves your physical health, improves your mental health. Um, And it's this book that he's written, Matthew Walker, um, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. Now, I saw that as a title. Someone recommended it to me and I'm like, this sounds ridiculous. Um, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. I will tell you, I read that and I started prioritizing sleep. He does not, he does a nice job, as, as nice a job as any, want, any scientist can like actually have a sense of humor. Like it's nerd humor in some places, but he's actually pretty funny, um, even for non-nerds. And he walks through and he ha- answers a lot of the questions that we have that um, that we've been talking about here and a lot of the, the a lot of the background. If you read it, you'll be like Sarah stole all of her stuff from him. I did because he does such a well and I added a few other things. But mostly I just grabbed stuff from him because he's fantastic and he's on point with all this stuff. Um, but when you look at caffeine and the purpose of caffeine, so the idea is that you have. So you have um, chemicals in your body that when you are tired, right, they start building when you wake up, it accumulates over 12 to 16 hours, turns down the volume of weight preventing regions. It can be thwarted by caffeine. So like if you, if you need to turn off that, like I'm tired sleep pressure, you can do it with caffeine. And it's, it, it is the most widely used psychoactive medication. Um, it's second most traded commodity over oil. That's because it works so well. Um, it latches on to your receptors and blocks sleepiness signals, and it peaks about 30 minutes after consumption. Half-life, about five to seven hours. And it has, um, it can interfere with sleep if you drink it too close to the time that it's um, through, around the time that you should be sleeping. It's removed through an enzyme of the liver, varying um, rates of degradation, depending on what you're drinking, how much, all those types of things. Um, and then it changes over time and with aging. So you might notice that like a cup of coffee at 20 does something different than a cup of coffee at at 50 does. Um, and then once the, the problem is once it's degraded, the caffeine crash builds because that the chemicals that adenosine has been building in your system. So it doesn't make that go away. It just thwarts it. Right. So that's the thing. That's the, the, the benefit and the drawback of caffeine is that it is beneficial. It can help for that. But if you use that consistently as your, um, approach to managing the sleep deprivation, you do have that crash and it's just, it, there's kind of no, you, you can't cap, you can't copy your way out of, um, out of the sleep. So I've tried it and I give it, I gave it again, the good old college try because I am a huge fan of coffee um, more than I should be. And I, like I say, do as I say, don't do as I do. Um, and when you look at, so what should we do about this, right? So we know that, that the 24 hour shift Um, Someone's going to have to be up in the middle of the night. And if you look at like traditional, uh, this is going to be completely unsatisfying for you when I get to the end, because the recommendations that they have, like any even, and even Walker's book, which I think, again, like a brilliant piece of work, a freaking brilliant piece of work. um, Even with what he does, that if you look at the tips, right, stick to sleep schedule as much as you can. Um, Exercise is great, but think about timing. Don't do it right, right before, um, right before bed. Use caffeine effectively. Don't use nicotine. And when I say caffeine effectively, like if you need a nap, because again, I, like I said, I'm a fan of the power naps, especially best way to um, manage that. If you're like super dragging in the afternoon, cup of coffee, then take a short nap. You don't want the long nap because then you, you know, you don't want to run whole cycles of rim and non, non-rim. But then if you do a short nap, when you wake up, you have the additive benefits of the cup of coffee. So about 30 minutes after the coffee kicks in um, and the rest. 
His other recommendations avoid alcohol right before bed. This is when um, I say that I'm a big advocate of day drinking instead of night drinking. Um, and avoid large meals or fluids right before bed. Obviously, you don't want to get up and have to eat all night long. No side effects of your medications and avoid ones that interrupt your sleep. Some of those are definitely things we can do, but consider timing of um, naps, not after three, if you work a regular nine to five, which you don't. Um, try to relax before bed. And then this is where I get to like, okay, hot bath before bed, get it close to your person shirt. Now, awesome if you're home and you can do that. But can you imagine if we had like bathtubs in the firehouse and everyone like went and like soaked in the tub for a couple hours that before bed? Like, not gonna happen. Um, you have a sleep promoting environment, dark, cool, and gadget free as much as possible. Again, if you're in a shared bunk room, that might not be a reality for you. Like that might not be possible. Um, but do make whatever sleep environment you have as, as good as possible. Get some sun every day just because that helps your body regulate and know when to um, when to be awake and when to sleep. And then just don't lie in bed when you're uh, awake, when you're tired. Because if you, what you don't want is some of the behavioral things where like people get used to being in bed awake and then your mind eventually associates bed with being awake instead of bed with being asleep. So some things like absolutely like there are things that you can do and i think in, as first responders they think it's challenging because there are things you can do but then there are things you can't do like that warm bath before bed not going to happen for you when you're at the firehouse um but that's so I, but I, I say this I, you know i give you all these like do these things although i know you can't i think that the take-home message for the fire service is that you have to do as much as you can when you can and coming back to the question about affecting families. I think you have to realize on multiple levels, first responders have to realize um, that one, their lack of sleep is affecting their family. So I think that sometimes that lack of sleep, you know, you are up all night and then come home and you're going to be in a shitty mood, not just because you're tired, but because you have all those behavioral health implications of not sleeping. So I think it does become then quickly a family affair. And I also think, you know, you're not going to have a perfect environment. You're not going to have, you're, you're never going to, um, even if you're, if even if you don't have a call all night long, it's still not the best. Still not the best sleep. Um, so I would say do what you can when you can. Is what is my best advice that we have so far that we're working on looking at empirically validating. Anyway, I I think that you have to do what you can when you can, even more so than your average person. Um, you know, your average banker, your average scientist, because you have more of an impact. Um, there is the question, are steam saunas installed for post-fire off-gas and useful instead of back? There's some debate about saunas and how the benefit, so there's some debate on some sites. Let me tell you, I will say this. The literature on um, saunas, especially like infrared saunas, on overall, cardi overall cardiovascular health, I think are, um, it, it has proven to be, especially in like the Netherlands and in countries like that where they are used pretty extensively. Um, Post-fire off-gassing, if that's a little bit of a question, I do think in terms of um, if that is a spot and a place that you can relax, I think anything that you can do to get more relaxed, anything you can do to like get in that mindset of just calm and oh, then I think do that. So if the sauna does that, I would say, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's all I've got. And I think I already went over time, but if... <laughs> No, no, there's no like overtime here. Okay. So I'll follow up with a couple of questions. You were talking yeah. about different shift schedules. And um, so it, uh, was there um, a difference in stress from staff that work 10 days versus 24, 48? So is there a specific maybe shift schedule that you found to be more advantageous to more regular healthy sleep cycles? So I, I, so I think we don't have that data yet, mm -hmm. but, and I think it depends. I think one of the reasons that data is going to be hard to get is because it varies so much by department and it varies so much by station within department. So I can tell you in the reviews I've read where it's just been a survey of, Hey, do you like this? Firefighters mm -hmm. tend to really like it. Uh, you know, <laughs> they like having that schedule. They like having the, the free time um, at home and they like consolidating this. So in terms of just, Hey, this, this is good. Um, for me, I, I like the schedule, yes. Um, in terms of impact for overall health, I can tell you what we do know. Don Abbott's done some work out of Arizona and he actually found that the highest rate for people who are 24, 48 
there seemed to be an uptick in May days at the very end, like the last 12 hours of their 48 hour shift. So I do think that, I think um, we don't have data yet on, we don't have solid data on things like injuries and accidents. There's been some speculation that it's higher with a, a 2448. Um, I, I, I think it goes back to you got to plan for the busiest station at the busiest firehouse and the busiest um, vehicle that goes out of it and then plan, you know, plan based on that. So not a lot of great data yet. I think the thing that will be a game changer is now that we've been able to look at, okay, we can put a strap on individuals, measure people at the individual level. That's going to be, I think that's going to tell us far more than what, you know. Are they, are they doing that now? Or they're, yeah. Yeah. How would, how would a department get involved in a study like that? Um, it depends. We have, so Joel's, I know, working on a couple studies. He had one um, that he had some mishaps and wasn't able to get funded. But I think, um, I do think one of the things that we're working on, and I've actually mentioned this to some of your folks, is we're developing what we're, um, what I'm lovingly calling the Science Alliance, it's Science the Station, and it's focused on health and wellness, but it's focused on connecting the science folks, the ACMED folks, the behavioral health providers with the fire service, so making those, you know, more accessible. Um, one of the things that I want to do, and we're actually going to do, and we're going to be in Florida at St. Pete's in week of Martin Luther King week, and we're going to have FDSOAs there, so we're going to piggyback with them, FRC is going to do some stuff there, and Bureau, and then we're, the Science Alliance is going to meet there. We're going to have what, what I'm calling nerd stock. We even have t-shirts. And it's going to be like updates on um, FEMA-funded studies, like what were the outcomes of those studies. But I want to start the conversation about how can we measure that? What should we be measuring? Um, you know, how can you know at the individual level? Because I think, you know, we talk about all this data and I think we need to do a better job of going, okay, how can I make it accessible? And how can I even make the methods accessible? Because this it's not like, I mean, we're not, I want to say we're not doing rocket science. It's literally not rocket science. It's other kinds of science, but it's not stuff that can't be done at the department level. So, yeah. I, and I do think at the individual level, like the whoop strap, anything like that, that helps you monitor your own sleep. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, for lack of a better word, play around with it. What works for you? What doesn't type stuff. Right. Interesting. I'm going to call you a question. Let's go. I do. I guess my question, Sarah, is do you ever, do you see departments migrating to three eight-hour shift days and five-day work weeks to deal with sleep? So have I seen any departments or do I think they should? Do you think, do you see it happening in the future? Because I do. I, you know, I don't, I think I can see a few instances where that can happen. Um, I think most departments will, I think that um, I think most people don't want that. Now, I do, so one of the things though that I think is a challenge, like, you know, you talk to FDNY has what, the 12 and 14s, 10 and 14s, whatever it is. Um, and what they do is they just trade shifts. And so they are working 24 hours at a time. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges is overcoming um, with that. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it would depend. I think a department that was really busy at night, I could see them doing that. And I don't think it's a bad idea for someone who, if you're up all night, I just don't think, I worked, like I mentioned LA County, one of the second, the second busiest house in the country. I saw a guy day three, so he's 72 hours in. And, you know, I saw him like the beginning of his, his first shift and he was all like, hey, da, 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 let's do this paperwork. I saw him three days later and I didn't even recognize him. And he's like, oh yeah, I saw you. At, and it was like, yeah, you look horrible. <laughs> but but I, so I think for places like that, like, it's not going to be popular, but I think, you know, you've got to, and I think as we start to quantify the risks of some of this stuff. So you, you talked about those shifts and I'll, and I'll, I'll go from, forget the firefighter part of it. I'll, I'll talk about the paramedic part of it. So um, in Baltimore, I'm on the second busiest medic in the city. That medic runs about 9,000 runs in a year. So, but to give you an idea, you talked about starting your shift later, and I will tell you, to work a 24-hour shift on my unit when I'm detailed to that unit kicks your ass from a, and we, we relieve either at five in the morning, I mean, our, our official relief time is seven, but we do courtesy reliefs at five or six, depending on the unit, so people can get out, go home and get the kids off to school, blah, 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 but um, at the end of the day, Doing the 24 is one thing. Doing what we call a reverse 24, when you come in at five o'clock in the afternoon 
and you're working to five o'clock the following, you know, afternoon, you're done. You're you're spent at noon time, and that last five hours is the worst. And then you're going to drive home and rush hour travel. I mean, I can say in your situation, this is the most elegant way I can say it, is you're pretty much screwed. <laughs> No matter what, with you know, writing a paramedic as as you know, writing as a paramedic on an email is as busy as you are. Like in that instance, yeah, I definitely think if you could do eight hour shifts, yes, I think. Um, but but the equally, I can speak to suppression, and when we're on suppression, we dispatch a suppression, a piece of suppression equipment on ninety five percent of our EMS runs. So just imagine. And, and we don't have transport units readily available. So that suppression company is going to babysit that patient for 35, 40 minutes sometimes waiting for a transport company. And they're going to pick up the next run when they clear. So it's not like they're going back and going to bed either. But right. they're working that straight 24. When, and, and I say it's weird because in the city, we have five different schedules. So depending on what your position is, you're, you're working one of five different schedules. And... So if you put in for overtime and you're going to work overtime on EMS and maybe a 10 hour day, 14 hour night, if you work in suppression and you're putting in for, again, you can do a 10 or a 12 or a 10 or 14 or a, um, a 24. Um, but we do have hours. Like if you're working the EMS rotation, you can't work more than 24 straight. If you're working in the suppression rotation, you can't work more than 38 straight. But when we're die, dire need, like we've been for the last five or six or seven months, all the rules are out the, out the yeah. window and you can work as much as you want. Yeah. So well, it's kind of scary because people walk around like zombies. Oh, right. And that is like literally taking years off of your life, which I get like it is, it's a pandemic where everyone's doing what they need to do, but that's where, and I have seen some departments get creative about that. Like where, especially when they have, um, you know, areas that are busy areas that aren't where people but that's not a popular thing either to not be in the same firehouse all the time or not to be in the same station all the time but like if it if it literally adds days and years to your life sometimes that might you know be the case like because it just it's what what we're doing to firefighters is it really is it's not it's not healthy and under the best scenario where you're you know slow station one or two calls it's not great for your health but like if you don't go to bed you like if you and read again read dr walker's book it it's scary how fast you see those decrements and like cognitive functioning and which where you don't realize it. like you know and you, if you look at like um data on lack of sleep and injuries or lack of sleep and um patient mistakes those types of things like it is like the relationship is beautiful but in a really sad and scary way so yeah and I think you know pandemic times all bets are off but I think in an ideal times that's a and, and and also because it relates to every other thing right circadian rhythm also regulates everything from your food patterns and your your emotions and cognitions and um and it regulates obesity and it re regulates um nutrition and it regulates like it's all the things really um so yeah, if you want to be healthy, basically shift work is really horrible <laughs> for your health. Don't do that. <laughs> but I'm not saying don't do that because someone's got to do it. Um, but that's why I think, you know, when you can sleep and prioritizing sleep as much as you can, in other instances, I think it's just really so important. Shift work also increases your different rates of, uh, rates of different cancers, right? Like oh, yeah. Cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you're damned if you do and you're damned right. if you do. So but someone needs to do it, right? What uh, what about law enforcement communities, right? Where they're working 12 hour shifts and overnight shifts. Maybe it's a 12 hour shift overnight. Um, what are some, and Roger, I promise I'm coming to you next. What are some concerns with that kind of shift work? Um, yeah. Because we really want to include all um, um, public servants in this conversation yeah. as it pertains to sleep. So I can tell you they have a lot of the same challenges. Um, what I think is, can be even worse. So that, so even worse than like, uh, you know, 24, 48, 48, 96 is doing days and nights and doing back and forth because your body never gets it. In fact, they've done studies on what is the best way. And the best way is especially like, they look at like hospital settings where they, 
you know, work their three different shifts. And it's really to roll forward, but to do it as consistently as possible. And so like the very worst schedule is for you to work like a couple of days and then a couple of nights, then a couple of days, a couple of evenings, couple of, uh, because your body never gets regulated to any of it. So it really is to go, okay, how can you, and I've talked to, I've talked to some departments, some police departments where they're like, they just schedule, sometimes you're in on a, in one month, you can have, you know, five day shifts, three evening and, and four. And, and I'm like, that's horrible. It's a horrible idea. Um, and it is dangerous because your body never gets a chance. So if you're going to work, if you have to work a, a mix, work your day day, work your days and then work the evenings and then work the overnights, but in like, not in a like day, evening, night, day, evening, night, and more of like a B, this is your day shift. And then, you know, you eventually switch to, because you, your body just never regulates to anything if you and, and just your patterns you know then you just never get good sleep so you're not going to get great sleep um either way but yeah don't do <laughs> i have some follow-up questions too but i want to get to roger first roger go for it so uh montgomery currently works well we have a combined system our most common schedule is 24 on 48 off we currently with um lack of staffing reverse that and end up with 48 on and 24 off because people are working overtime there's a big push on the union oh so and then there are day workers that work just day work and go home every night they will work four 10-hour shifts and that's their um that's their their work shift um but there's a big push by the union to go 24 72 and lose our Kelly days. Is that actually a healthier shift because you're going to get more time in bed in your in your own bed? Um, hopefully in a norm. Paul's shaking his head, but uh, no, because everybody's going to work overtime during that 72 hours, or they're going to go work their second. And well, third so night. we have a maximum of 48 consecutive hours, and we enforce that. So you're never going to pick up more than 48. You certainly could work your 24. Up, I can go pick up two 12s at the hospital. There's another right. 24. Or pick up two 10s day side and then go back, have a day off. And, and But in theory, right, if you're observing that 48 maximum consecutive, is that, but you said you can't catch up on sleep. So yeah, does it I I would say, again, we don't have an answer to that specific question. I think the more consistency you can have, the better. The more control you can have, the better. Um, I think shift times are going to start. But I think that's back to, like, um, when Paul was talking about his, you know, people are going to work these other shifts. I think that's part of the reason that we need to start educating people about, like, you, this is, like, you can't just not sleep. Like, it seems like, oh, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And I've got to work a second job or a third job or I mean, that's another thing that I think it comes back to education of the fire service, but it, it, it is, you're, you're screwed with having to be up at night. Like you're, there is going to be that negative impact. And I get that, you know, everyone wants to work a second job. I get the money issues. I get all of that, but you have to think about how that balance it balances with your overall health and wellness. I think, you know, if you can do, I can see a benefit of the, just thinking through the empirical approach to a 24 or 72, because then you would have the time off and you would consistently have those days. Um, but I don't know, I don't have data on it, so I can't say one way or the other. But I do think it's back to what Paul said, like you can always pick up shifts, you can always work a second job, you can always, and I get that, and I understand why, so I'm not trying to downplay that. But I think people, we really have to start educating people about that does not come without a sometimes very significant cost. Then the second part of the question would be, if the firehouse has an environment that allows somebody to truly get back to sleep after they've been woken up, is that going to make a difference? Or is that interrupted sleep pattern a no recovery. I mean, so sleep number has entered the, the commercial um, realm. They're, they're, they're at FDIC. Yeah. And I, I don't sleep on a sleep number bed at home. 
but if people get to sleep or get into a deeper sleep, is that going to make a difference yes. in maintaining their stress? Yeah, yeah, it is. And really, I mean, that's why you want the environment to be as sleep promoting as possible. Because yeah, it's not going to be the same as sleeping through the night, but it's still going to be better than not going back to sleep. And so you want to create as you know, and I know people have talked about like the downsides of individual bunk rooms and, you know, it doesn't, there's not quite the community and stuff like that. I would say sleep, getting people as much sleep as possible and as good sleep as possible is absolutely important. In fact, I know um, there was one conversation about tones. There's a group that's getting ready to, I think, present up at the N triple F um, innovation forum. And we're actually working with them on a project where they've come up with a tactile alerting system. So it's not that loud. And and also, I think looking at things like should um, does everyone have to be woken up for every call? I mean, I know I know departments where a call comes in to the to the entire department and everyone in the department is woken up. That's ridiculous. Like that cannot be the way it is anymore. And apologies to any department that has that, but that can't be the way it is anymore. You should only be called. You should only hear that or feel that or be woken up if you absolutely if that is your call that you have to go out for. Um, even if it's even, you know, within the fire, like as much as we can pin down to decreasing awakenings for people who don't have to be awake at night, we, that's, yes, that we need to do. The, the new technology is allowing for that and building new stations, but in old stations, the, the technology is not there. You have a wide open floor plan. Even if you put the speaker at the bed, the beds will change. They move them around. So it, it, it doesn't work. The soft, the soft alerting, most, I will tell you, at least in my company, most people sleep light to begin with because we are always up. You don't want to miss that. We're judged by, you know, our turnout times. Um, you know, we have 40 seconds, 45 seconds to get out. And it's, so, so you sleep light. Um, so even, even with a light alerting system, you're still sleeping light. So you're not truly getting it, that nice, deep, comfortable sleep, worrying about, you know, the buzzer getting ready to go off. Yeah. Um, even if it doesn't go off the whole night, which unfortunately it does, but if it didn't, you still lost a good sleep because of that. Yeah, my better half, before he retired, bless his heart, lucky duck, um, he was a deputy fire chief and he had to monitor the radio all night. And if someone called out sick, like he had to sit up and make phone calls in the middle of the night to get somebody to come in on overtime the next day. Um, so I agree that, you know, finding grant funding or um, something to bring antiquated systems into more technology savvy. That's the nicest way I can put this. I'm yeah. looking words more te technology savvy environments so that sleep is a priority for first responders is really important and there's a lot of grant opportunities out there to do things like that my department is a very large department and we had a significant amount of grant funding offered to us and given to us in order to create more technology forward sleeping you know focused um, fire station environment. So um, I think that's really important. Um, I see Sean's hand up and I'm going to acknowledge you in just a moment. Um, I just want to swing back around while he's still in his car. We talked about <laughs> um, overnight shifts and the fluctuation in shifts, right? So you go from days to night and days to night and just how detrimental that can be. Um, Let's say that I'm on a consistent overnight shift as a law enforcement officer or whatever it is, right? I, I'm doing this overnight shift. What are the ideal sleep environments that me and my family can create at home when I get there after this overnight shift in order to maximize my health and my sleep wellness? So it's definitely things like a cooler environment. People sleep better when it's a little bit cool, um, dark even like the blue light, you know, getting rid of blue lights and, um, you know, phones and gadgets. I get like, you know, I sleep with my phone next to my bed, but ideally um, you don't. I say that knowing that most people are going to anyway, um, but really creating it, but then also behaviorally creating that sleep environment. Like I think the best investment you can make is really comfortable, a really comfortable bed and a perfect, you know, a, a comfy bed, blankets you love, all those types of things. I think that that is actually 
um, a splurge that's worth it in terms of your overall health and wellness. Um, so I think that, and then also behaviorally having that space, your sleep space, your, you know, your bedroom being for that. I mean, I think now one of the challenges is so often like, you know, COVID like offices have become in the bedroom and there's, you know, there's, it becomes where everything happens and you're working out there and then you're, but the problem is then your mind associates being in the bedroom with doing work and working out and do, you know, doing all these things. And what you really want is you want your mind to associate you, lay, you laying down in bed as being like, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and now I'm going to do the rest. So I think that anything that you can to make, um, you know, cold, dark, places in the house or whatever that you can uh, I know it seems like, like you're sleeping in your sub basement which is not really but um yeah, separating workspaces from sleep spaces because I'm guilty as charged I could sit in my bed and watch tv all day but I also I turned 40 and sleeping is like really like a problem for me <laughs> so um so sitting in my bed is like a thing now but I, I hear you colder darker spaces you know, limited blue lights, that's TV and firefighters are guilty. We all have, at least in my department, we all have TVs in our bunk rooms. We have, you know, um, it's funny because one of our stations being renovated and um, we were talking about setting up, they're an, you know, a single company station and we were talking about setting up, um, you know, cubicle spaces for their sleep spaces in the gym so we can renovate their sleep space. And we were actually like, you know, screw them. There's not going to be outlet outlets for their phones and stuff like that. And it was like this really big deal <laughs> that they weren't going to be able to plug their phone in next to their bed for the evening. And yet when you study sleep, like that blue light thing in your phone is like a really big problem. Um, and so it's interesting that you bring that up and how much we can stress the importance of that. So, um, all right, I'm Sean. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sarah, go. Oh, I was just going to say, I also think there's a lot of work going around along, um, along with like relaxation and those types of things. I, there's a group out in Colorado that does some cool stuff on sleep. Um, Jacqueline, G. we had them on to me. Oh, I, I love her. Yes. I that what they do is awesome. And she, yeah. um, it, like in terms of like that there and I'm I'm actually kind of becoming a believer I've been doing some of the research on the yoga practice that she's been talking about and I do think I mean just you have to train you have to train your brain and you yeah. have to your brain to turn off so yeah I think I love everything that she does yeah she's we had them on and so for anyone that's listening to this or anyone that's here now you can access that evening's um, webinar on our YouTube page she went through an entire relaxation cycle. And I've heard from a number of people that have accessed her resources or even just that webinar um, really helps them get into the mind frame of sleep after a call when you know you you need to grind those gear backs and get into that relaxation phase. So um, you can access that on our web on our YouTube page, or um, um, she also is. I think she's like on the calm app and like she's everywhere. Um, and yeah. really she was awesome. So I agree with you. They were, they were really great. So, um, all right, Sean, let's hear it. What questions do you have? Hey, so obviously this one hits, uh, close to home. I I've been kind of screaming from the rafters about this for a few years now. And, um, everything that you're saying is like on point and it's, definitely based in fact i think the problem is is it just doesn't translate to the line personnel and i think paul was paul paul's hitting on it right there like he's a medic he's on a box he's running these calls and i think until we start giving solutions to antiquated chiefs on antiquated systems on how to actually implement them um it's just us kind of moving um information around right like so i now have it you have it paul has it and you know but then how does it get into the hands of the people who have it and what are they going to do with it? I think there's probably some, the next stage of these is going to be like, okay, let's assess why are we running calls all night long? And then you look and you see that the bulk of the calls are running all night are absolute garbage or not emergency calls. Right. And well, I mean, it, it is what it is, you know, and, and, I, and I'm, I've been doing this way too long and I've watched too many people get sick 
based upon an antiquated system where somebody's not willing to educate the public and say, this is why you call 911 and this isn't why you call 911. So I, I think those are some, those are some things that maybe we can dig into to say like, well, are we actually running? Are we providing the service that we say we're providing? Or are we just providing a service? And if that's the case, private industry could probably do it a lot better for a lot cheaper. And they could probably do it on a regular shift, shift schedule, which they do in all the other venues like airports and pilots and truckers and everyone else. So that's my first little soapbox. The other one is, is the, um, the sleep tracking is absolutely imperative. I've been tracking my sleep since 2018. And so I can tell you when I come off shift and I do look like a zombie and I'm trying to mitigate that to be a better husband and a better father, um, all I have to do is look at that sleep tracker and it tells the story. Hey man, like you got to recover because if you don't recover, then you're probably going to be less of a good version of yourself for all the people that are important to you. So um, just some tidbits of information I've seen. I, I want to see the rubber meet the road. I want to see it continue to push. Um, it's a very slow moving, you know, thing, but I think this, these are the good parts and this is really good information. So I appreciate you taking the time, Sarah. I, sometimes I get, sometimes people are like, oh, you're too much of a poly in it about this stuff. And I get frustrated sometimes because I feel like, oh my God, we've like, we've been doing all this and we have all this data and we have all these numbers and we have all these priorities and is anything changing? But then I look at, I think about some of the stuff, like we have a couple of projects on what, the health of women and the fire service. And I think, um, you know, we're sitting in this room full of meeting with the stakeholder panels. This one meeting in particular, we had the fire administrator and it, this was back when it was um, Jeff or, or Keith, sorry, Keith Bryant. And, um, you know, we're all talking about this issue and it was like so frustrating because so many people are like, I feel like we've been talking about this for so long. And I was like, hold up. Yes, we have been talking about this for a long time. And some people are those early adopters, you know, Sean, you've been talking about this for longer than, you know, than anybody else. But we also have to remember that you know, 10 years ago, none of this would have been a discussion. You know, the health of women in the fire service a decade ago, like I actually sat seven years ago at a research conference where they said, should we even be studying women? Like, isn't that a waste of money when we have all these other topics to look at? So now we have funded projects on the health of women in the fire service. We have funded projects on sleep in the fire service looking at research. We're translating the stuff slowly. But if you look at like, no one was even taught, I mean, 10 years ago, people weren't even wearing their SCBAs consistently. And to fires. Now, granted, there's still places that are like the doctors of <laughs> CBA um, fad. They're still waiting for it to pass. But like, I think it's coming. And I think maybe this is just because I'm so, you know, I'm a, I'm a hammer. So everything's a nail, but I hear more people asking me sleep questions than almost any other topic that when I go out and present a general health and wellness stuff. And I hear more people talking about what can we do to prioritize and more people starting to go, okay, let's rethink all of this. Does everyone need to be up in the middle of the night for some of these things? Like, you know, if, if grandma needs to be picked up from the um, bedroom, does she, you know, because of course she's wedged herself in between the toilet and the wall and you're, you know, then we have a whole like another risk for injury type of issue. But does everyone need to show up for that at 2 a.m.? Maybe not. And so I think it is, I mean, like, yes, it is frustrating, especially when you've been on the early adopter phase, but I have to believe like there's a podcast about this or like a, a, um, a meeting about this that we're filming, that we're putting online, that people will listen to. And I'm not the first person that you've had on talking about sleep. Like that says something about the culture change and culture change. Yeah, it starts top down, but it also starts bottom up. And the fact that you're like, hey, let's jump on and, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo and talk about this topic. Like I have to, I, and maybe it's just because I have to believe this or I get too depressed in my job because <laughs> I feel like I'm wasting my time and energy, but this is a conversation now. I've had people call me specifically asking, can you come do a two hour presentation on sleep? And I'm like, bring it. Yes. I, you know, like I'm getting calls. Like, can you come and talk about reproductive health? I'm like, are you effing kidding me? I would love to, but that would not have been a phone call that anyone would have gotten. I mean, first of all, a decade ago, you didn't have anyone who had any, who had any research on that to share, but like now there's research to share on it. We're asking, like, we're, we're digging into questions. Like what about a 2472 versus a 2448? Like that was not a question five years ago. You know, so I think 
I totally understand your frustration, um, especially when you have been like an early adopter of it. But keep beating the drum because people are starting to listen. You know, this I am. I'm stubborn. I will. And I appreciate it. I appreciate and they it. They really will. Do. Like people are gonna start to listen. You're gonna, we're not gonna get everyone. There's like great, have you ever read the if anyone's ever read the tipping point book, like it's this great book about how, you know, if you like basically divide into, you know, into standard deviations, you have everything's in a normal curve, right? And so you're gonna have your early adopters that are like, you know, the people that knew I they wanted an iPhone before iPhones existed. My sister is one of them. And you know, then you get like the rest of that, you know, kind of second standard deviation. Then you get to start to get to the middle. And at some point you get enough people where like you see that tipping point, you know, and then you get the people who will never have an iPhone, but there's a, it's there and it's tipping. And I really, I really think we are seeing, we are a tipping point on the self and wellness stuff. So keep up the good fight. And the only reason, Sean, why I was like, uh, when you were saying what you were saying is I remember COVID is really hard to remember time frames, but something like five years ago, um, some of these sleep studies were coming out of Canada. And so I work for it in an extremely large fire department. And I went to my assistant chief and I was like, do you understand that sleep is literally affecting and is, is measurably detrimental to the mental health of our firefighters? Why are we not addressing this? Why are we not discussing a culture change where we shift into um, healthier um, shift schedules to promote better sleeping habits. And the response was, well, people have secondary jobs. And I said, but this is your career. Shouldn't this be your main focus? And he said, culture will never move in that direction. So you need to let it go. And um, so when Sean says like, you know, waking up in the middle of the night to pick someone up off the floor. I can't tell you how many times I was called to reset the um, life alert button. She doesn't know how to reset it. Are you literally calling my unit out right now to press a button on her life alert unit at three o'clock in the morning? So um, I hear you. I just, you know, uh, you just learn that like, this is your job and part of it is PR and you need to go out there and smile and hit the button and come back and go to sleep. But it ruined my entire night of sleep to go hit that button for her. So um, I didn't need to be, you know, mocking or anything what Sean said. I've been advocating this for years on my department and I've been told, you know, you're never going to create this culture change ever. And so let it go because you're going to be the bad guy for people that hold secondary jobs. So I, I see you, Sarah, wanting to say something. And with what you're going to say, have you been able to create a culture change on a department so they adopt better sleeping? So I think if you look nationally at fire service, so my favorite, favorite, favorite example is smoking in the fire service. So you look at smoking rates and they didn't study it like two decades ago but the few research studies that were out there they did like have it as a covariate they would so they'd report it but they it wasn't the primary outcome right but you said extremely high levels of cigarette use often higher than the general population up there with like the military i mean like it was it was it was high it was very high especially in certain areas now you look nationally and it's not just our study and we've done national studies like Maine to Guam we've done central studies we've done like we've we've been we've been around we've we've been around a little bit it's consistently low rates of cigarette use in the fire service compared to general population compared to the military when you go when we did qualitative stuff and this is like 10 years ago when we talked about okay let's talk about health and wellness what do you think about cigarette use if there was a smoker in the room everyone was like oh that asshole still smokes blah 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 now, smokeless tobacco still high and actually higher than the general population here than the military, but smoking, like the peer pressure around smoking, significant shift, right? It went from higher than the general population to this is not what we do. We, I met with Rich Duffy back in the day at IFF headquarters, and he got to the section on um, smoking. He goes, we will be the first tobacco-free unit. And I'm like, how does that infiltrate? How does that happen? And you see it happens through peer pressure and it happens through more education and awareness about what the challenges are. It happens, you know, you, I have seen departments, you, I've seen departments that are incredibly healthy or crews that are incredibly healthy 
And it is contagious with that peer pressure. And we can, I think part of it is understanding. I don't, I did not, before I really started digging into sleep, I didn't, I undervalued how important sleep was. I thought, oh yeah, sometimes it's important. Oh no, 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 no. I now see it as like, it, it is a priority over even working out. If I can't get to bed, because I, I work out at 5 a.m. If I can't get to bed early enough, I will sleep instead of do my workout. Because there's actually data to suggest that it's more important to have that sleep than it is than you, the benefit you get from a single workout. So not that I'm saying don't work out, but I think that we have, and look at SCBA use, right? Back to that. It now, there was a time, I mean, not that long ago, I was at one department that didn't even have SCBAs. They used um, hospital, like particular, like surgery masks instead of SCBAs. That's not now people look at me and they're like, are you effing kidding me? That was not like, there was a time that no one wore SCBAs at all. Like now we're like, oh, you should wear it for overhaul. You should, wear it. and yes, you should. But like, there was a point in time where people didn't wear SCBAs ever because you didn't want to look like, you know, you didn't want to, I'm trying to think of a more appropriate word than the one coming to mind, but you didn't want to look like a weak person, you know? Um, so I think it's coming. I think that it's now that we're, and you know, not that it's all due to data, but I think as we build data to go, okay, whoa, 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 you need to understand, like, here's your cancer risk. And because your cancer risk is elevated because of the exposures, these things, you absolutely, it cannot, it's, this is not optional anymore. You have to do these other things that are helpful. About it. And I, I, I just want to say oh. that in 1979, as a high school cadet, SCBA was optional in my department. <laughs> And, and optional means you don't do it. Use it, right? But um, my my question is, from your experience, how many departments leadership are supporting your NAPs? I mean, that's a that's a no brainer. And my department does support that, especially if you're picking up an overtime shift and you're busy the night before. But it sounds to me like you have a you that's that's the abnormal and not not accepted i would say just of the like offhand i would when i ask about it i would say about half the departments that i've visited now granted i'm i'm working with departments that invite a scientist in to come do research so if they're going to be a little more health promoting in general um but i've had been asked like in chiefs conferences where i've been presenting on something and they'll be like so what about these naps and i'm like yes and they're all like, oh shit, like you read for real? And I'm like, yeah, no, yes, that is that is a thing. It's not people just being like, like, this actually is a key health risk factor. It is something that you need to consider. It is some you absolutely should allow that. I mean, within reason, like it's not like you nap an entire day away, but but that's the thing is I think as we can, and that's why I want to do studies that are more specifically looking at the individuals, because as soon as we can quantify that and then put it into a number, decrease risk of injury by X amount, which then becomes this amount of money, city governments that are at right now like, oh, no, 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 are going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's right. That's the other thing where I see research headed next is we need to start quantifying this stuff. We have an economist um, on staff with us that we've started looking at, like, how can you, how can we quantify these pieces and so you know when the department when the union when the chief whoever it is that's making this argument can go okay here's what we can expect long term because I do think honestly I think if if we can improve sleep then you're, I do believe you're going to see fewer injuries you're going to see fewer um you know lost duties presenteeism and absenteeism are going to go I mean I think that it's I think it's a real I think it's a real thing. I think this is, you know, everyone looks for the golden ticket. And I think this could be a piece of a golden ticket when we look at like overall impact. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up uh, follow question to that. Explain what a power nap is, right? Because when I'm on shift, if I'm not woken up, I'll sleep for two hours in the middle of the day. And then at nighttime, I'm screwed, right? I'm not, I'm not going to sleep properly. So if you could give a proper definition of what a power nap looks like and how you can fall into that proper window, um, that would be amazing. So it's really looking at, I'm trying to see if I have the, uh, it's really looking at, it came out of the military, or not the military, sorry, um, studies that they did on 
human factors with um uh, with pilots. Can you see my screen or is that yep? You can't okay, perfect. I'm not even gonna make it the full screen. You get the idea. Um, they did it looking at with pilots, and they found that when you looked at um looked at risks for times where things would go wrong, it was mostly at the uh but when the, at the time when people were landing. And so they tested maps and inserting of different time points in, um, in long hauls. And what they found is that this prophylactic maps were actually the benefit. So it's not like when you're so, so, so exhausted, you can't keep your eyes open that you do a quick nap. It's that you have to realize like, hey, I'm probably gonna be exhausted you know, by five o'clock to, tonight. And so realizing at like noon that you could take a good 30 minute nap and be what you don't, you don't want to get to where you're, you know, at, it, your body's like, oh, okay, I'm asleep for the night. And then you have that, like, because then you're doing two hours and you wake up with that, like, drowsy feeling. But it really is looking at prevention versus um, over, uh, prevention over treatment. So not waiting till you're totally exhausted, but basically looking ahead to what that was. There was actually, and I've got some cool st studies in here too. This one I really liked. Um, it looked at and actually it's uh, in Greece, but when you look at like, ideally what our bi our bodies want, it's, it's to basically sleep all night and then have a short nap in the afternoon. So this, um, this study was done in Greece and it was looking at people who were basically, um, and I don't have a year for this, but they had, like, it was kind of what would occur outside of our modern culture. And so they found that they actually left to kind of their own devices and not being part of the Western culture that they would do, you know, their good nights, their a good night's sleep, close all the businesses in the afternoon for like 30 to 60 minute nap time. So they would do like a lunch and then a, a nap time, which I think sounds brilliant. I'm still trying to talk my end of the office, my office into it. Um, nobody is on board, maybe because we only have one couch, but um, this example in Greece, 37% increase in risk of death from heart disease in six years when they went out of that pattern, when they went, okay, no, 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 we're only going to start, uh, we're only going to, you know, do our sleep at night and then we have to work all day. Um, and they, but they found in this one area where they had continued to have this nap that they were four times more likely to reach 90 years old than the air, other areas of Greece where they switched to the, um, to the monophasic pattern instead of the nap in the afternoon. So yeah, I would say, it, and again, if you're going to use it with, um, if you're going to use it with, with caffeine, cup of coffee, 30 minute nap, you're good to go. Cup of coffee, not a pot of coffee. I have migraines with caffeine, so I have to be super careful, but I hear you. Well, that and you. My that my grandfather told me that um, coffee would stunt my growth, and I was super set on being five seven, and no one told me that I am Jewish and bored for breeding, and that that was just not going to be a thing for me. So I didn't drink coffee, and everyone thinks that I'm weird that I still don't drink coffee. <laughs> okay. I still might grow. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right? My back injury that made me shorten is not an issue. I will grow. Um, but um, yeah, another question to that is, okay, so I'm on shift, right? Um, my department specifically works at 2448. So I'm on shift and I have some broken sleep when I'm on shift and I come home. How long should I be sleeping when I come home, right? I'm not going to, I need to be able to sleep at night. How long should I be sleeping when I come home from shift to ensure that I'm still um, attaining some quality sleep in the evening as well? A good question. I don't have an exact answer to it. Um, I, I could, I mean, I'm sure that we could look at like general recommendations, but I actually think Sean's approach of monitoring your own sleep and seeing kind of what the ideal is for you, because that's the other thing is different people sleep differently. I think monitoring your own sleep is a brilliant idea because you do see changes across time. You can see, you can know when you feel really, um, really good and when you don't. And, you know, you can see if I do, you know, a five hour stretch, is that too much? Is two hours um, my sweet spot? And I do think that we all, there's a benefit to kind of biohacking yourself and monitoring that across time, keeping a little cap. We totally nerded out one time, my sister and I did, and we tracked everything about what she did and we found you know, with her and I, that there were like, some things had like a two day leg, other things were a one day leg, you, you know, that there were certain things that I could eat or times I could eat things like that would make me feel better or worse. And so 
I think that some of that you have to get kind of at an individual level to find your sweet spot. Amazing. Oh, it's all, it's all. Anyone else have go, Sean? Go for it. Come on. Hey, so uh, that book that Dr. Walker wrote, he talks about uh, morning larks and night owls. And uh, I, I found it to be, that plays into um, like my sleep habits as well. So I, I'll, I'll try to be a morning lark, but I'm inherently a night owl. Um, so I'll biohack, I'll do everything. I have a sauna, like I'm like totally into trying to get everything as, as best as I can to put me in the best place possible. The problem is, is uh, sometimes I think genetically, I just, I'm predisposed to be a different way. So I, I, there is like a learning curve that comes with tracking all of that. Um, and, and it can be a, a bit much and you can nerd out on the data, but I think if you look at the trends, you can actually see uh, some things that will work really good for you when you come off and you're beat up. Yeah. It, but did you not love that book? Oh, it's the best. I probably, yeah. I, and I think he's doing like an addendum to it, I think as we speak or something. I am such a fan of his work. I just, I, and I think that book, he, he explains, he covers so much. And he explains it in a way that it's like, ah, that's what makes way more sense than the 17 studies I just read on it. He's just, I mean, and in a little bit, it's nerd jokes, nerd, nerd humor, but he's a little funny. No, you no, know? he's good. And I think he was just on another podcast where I heard him going into some of the changes he made to the original um, book that he found out afterwards that some of the, the information he had was a little bit off. But What's for the most part, really good, you know? Yeah. It's always evolving. I mean, that's the thing that, like I talked about the circadian feeding, um, you know, but that was a study um, that Dr. Panda did and we'll have to see how it comes out. But I think it's a really interesting idea. So I think that's one of the things on the horizon we need to be like, oh, let's keep an eye out on that. Because I mean, you know, eating in the middle of the night, especially when you get back from a ship or from a nasty call, like it's not probably the best food choices, especially if the you know grandma down the street brought you brownies that's when you're gonna eat the brownies and stuff like that so but yeah it's a it's a it's good stuff um kelly O'Dear, um she's not here but um for those of the, those of us that are here and um for those of us those of us that are listening um there um apparently he's really amazing at ted talks as well so anyone who wants to google matt walker's ted talks she said that they're stellar and something that you should look at as well and as an auditory learner myself um i intend to look at that um i know that a lot of firefighters um first responders in general dabble in substance use or misuse whatever you want to classify it as in order to attain sleep, right? Um, what should we know about sleep and substance in order to attain the goal of sleep, right? How does substance affect our sleep? So unfortunately, alcohol is not good for your sleep. And it seems like it is, cause you're like, oh, it's a depressant. So I'm gonna have a, you know, I'm gonna have a, um, a a bottle of whiskey before bed, or I'm going to have, you know, a couple of beers or whatever it is. First of all, don't ever drink a bottle of whiskey, but all at one time at least. Um, but it seems like it's a depressant, so it's good for you to go to bed, right? But it's actually not. So it interrupts sleep more than you think, which is why they say don't drink right before bed, which is why you should definitely be a day drinker instead of a night drinker. But um, especially the rates that firefighters drink. So on average, when firefighters drink, it's about three and a half drinks, which by the way, also happens to be where you see increased risk for cancer. But what, when you, while you think that you're getting good night's sleep, what research has found is that you're actually not getting that good deep sleep. And so a lot of times you're actually waking up repeatedly overnight when you've been drinking right before you go to bed, you don't necessarily realize it or recognize it, but it actually is horrible for your sleep to drink before bed. Um, and, you know, with other substances, depending on what substances like tobacco, uh, you know, nicotine and things like that. One of the challenges with that is that, you know, when you feel like, oh, I really need another cigarette or, oh, I really need another dip and you need that stuff, that's the withdrawal symptoms. And so you definitely don't want that before bed. Um, I generally don't think people should be doing things like cocaine anyway. Um, <laughs> but I think with substances, I don't follow, good, follow me for more good health tips. Um, but I, th I, you know, I think really any, um, 
any substance you really have to watch out because most of them are going to interfere. Now, sleep folks would say you really shouldn't even be having to use, um, you know, melatonin or Benadryl or, or anything like that. I talked to people who are like, I really can't. That's, um, I, I would say, you know, I, you gave the caveat of get your health information. So, you know, you don't, if you don't take this as your personal health information, but um, I think sleep is so important. I think sometimes for folks who can't get to sleep any other way, you need some melatonin. Like it's, is it the best thing to do? No, you should be doing what Sean does and paying attention to your sleep and biohacking yourself. But sometimes you just gotta go to bed. And Mark um, just dropped to the podcast, uh, excuse me, in the um, chat, uh, Jocko's, what was it, 3.30? Jocko's uh, 3.32 podcast on ownership over your own uh, psychological well-being. Dr. And so, Dr. Andrew Huberman. I'm going to save that podcast. Yeah. Um, so um, thanks, Mark, for dropping that into the chat. Um. With that, I am I'm going to stop the recording here and thank everyone for joining us and continue the conversation if anyone has any questions. Sarah, I just want to thank you. You are so relatable and um, you are someone that in the fire service specifically, at least I can speak to that, that um, I feel like I can connect with. Thank you for your dedication, passion, and enthusiasm for making sure that first responders are meeting the best health that they can. Um, and thank you for your time this evening. I hope to have you back, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, in the future to discuss other important factors as it pertains to first responders. With that, I'm going to stop um, the recording and thank you for everyone who's listening and was with us, with this, uh, with us this evening. Thank you so much.